And I was thinking, I get to preach and that's a blessing, but then Diane's over there holding baby Annabelle and <laughs> that's a blessing too. And I'm kind of like, I don't know if I got the better end of the deal here or not, I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyways, there were two men who, who boarded a plane on the east coast and they were flying to the west coast. And so they sat down, the plane took off, and the number one, I'll just call him number one man, number two man, number one man, page leafed through the magazine that they have on the plane and, and things, and they knew it was going to be a fairly long flight. After he'd done that, he looked to the number two man beside him, and he said, so, he said, what do you do for a living? And the fellow said, well, he said, I'm a minister with the church. And uh, he said, oh, I don't believe in that stuff. He said, that stuff's just for children. He said, you know, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And the, the minister kind of smiled and laughed a little bit. And he said, yeah. He said, what do you do for a living? He said, oh, I'm an astronomer. And the preacher laughed and he said, oh, I thought that was child stuff. You know, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. But there's a lot of people in the world that really think it's just child stuff and that it's not relevant. Romans chapter 1 verses 18 to 20 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, not of children, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God's shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. What Paul's saying is there's some intelligence in this design. It's designed by a God, a creator. And we can see the power if we're willing to look at creation and you look at the birth of a baby child and, and how they grow and, and you can't help but be in awe of God how he designed it all. And so a lot of people that claim today it's mother nature, it isn't mother nature, it's God. And you can look in the world and everywhere you look you can see the goodness of God. I had a person tell me that this life was their hell. And I said no that's impossible. And I can explain that to you because the sun rises on you. The rain falls on you. The, the food is all here for you to eat that God's provided. Everything that God provided is here. All the good things are here. And so everything that is good is from God. James says every good gift and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. That's the goodness that we have. And you can see it because God is the author of good. And this is his creation. So you can see it everywhere you look. On the flip side of that, you can see evil everywhere you look. Because the prince of this world is evil. And he's trying to get us to deny God. I mean, you see every day the shootings and murders, the the immorality, the, I mean, whatever sin you want to name is out there and you can see it. And you go, yuck. And yet, many people today see no good or need or value in Christ's church. Many say it's a waste of time. I'm too busy with life to be bothered with that stuff. And they make comments like that. And so I thought today it would be encouraging for us to look at how blessed we are to be in Christ, to be his church and his kingdom on earth. You know, the greatest invitation ever extended to mankind, we find in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Jesus said, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus invites us 
to come to Him. And He doesn't just leave us hanging there, but He helps us every day in our daily living. If we walk in Christ, if we're walking in Him, we have His support every day. You know, I often think what it would have been like to be one of the apostles, to walk physically with Jesus on this earth. It would have been amazing. But the reality is, we get to walk on this earth every day with Jesus. And it is amazing. We just don't have Him physically standing beside us. But we walk with Him. We walk in the Spirit, as He walks in the Spirit, Galatians 5.16. We walk in the light, as He is in the light. We walk in newness of life, because He's given us that new life. We walk in love, because of His love for us. We walk by faith in Him. We have our faith in Him. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and in verse 7, Paul says, Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. We have the opportunity to turn our life around, not to live our life the way that we lived it in the world, but to live it a new life in Christ, one that glorifies Him and glorifies the Father in heaven. And He is walking right there with us and helping us with that walk. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16, we're told that we are strengthened, the inner man is strengthened by His Spirit. He gave us His Spirit to help us in our walk. We sang the song about Him walking with us today. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, He talks about the Spirit helping us in our prayer life. And so as we go through this life, we need to understand and recognize the blessing we have. That Christ is walking with us. Do you think about that when you're doing things? That Christ is right there with you? He is. He's walking with you. He's doing it with you. And He's also helping us in our struggles. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, but I know that temptations come my way, and I'm sure that temptations come your way if you're living in the, this world, the same world I'm living in. And so we have temptations on a daily basis. We have Desires that come up that we shouldn't have sometimes and we've got to get rid of them and take those thoughts captive for Christ. But He's there to help us. In Hebrews chapter 2, and starting in uh, verse 16, the Hebrew writer says, For surely it is not angels that He helps, but He helps the offspring of Abraham. Now, I know you realize that you're the offspring of Abraham, right? Because those who are in Christ by faith are the offspring of Abraham. And so he says those are who Jesus helps. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. That's a blessing, folks. Jesus can help us, if we allow him, with our temptations, to beat the temptations that come from the evil one. We have that blessing as Christians. He wants to help us, and he can help us, but we have to let him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and in verse 13, Sorry, I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 13. He says, For we are not writing to you anything other than what you read and understand, and I hope you'll fully understand. No, that's not the one either. Okay, anyways. Um, 
Maybe I think I know what it is. It's First Corinthians 10 and verse 13. I just forgot the zero there. That's what it is. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And I want to say with that, that he's already provided the way. Because he's the way that we're able to fight the temptation and move on in our life in serving him. And so Jesus is there to help us with our struggles. That's a blessing. That's a blessing the world doesn't have and can't have outside of Christ. And so as you go through your daily life, whether it's praying, whether it's working, whether it's playing, entertaining, shopping, visiting, driving, reading his word, studying, sharing the gospel, whatever you're doing, just going for a walk, Jesus is there with you to help you. And the world doesn't have that. You know, when you're facing an adversity, Jesus is there with you. The world doesn't have that. They don't have that strength or anything that, that Jesus gives us for that fight, for, to, to help us to be calm and to get through that struggle. And so Jesus is there helping us in our daily life, and that is a blessing that we ought to cherish. But there's more blessing than that being a Christian. Jesus provides for all of our needs. Now, you need to understand, when I say that, I'm not saying for our wants and desires. I'm saying he provides for all of our needs. In Matthew chapter 6, and uh, starting in verse uh, 25, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of your life? And why are you so you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus says God knows exactly what you need. And even if you think you know exactly what you need, you better check with God, because God knows better. He knows what you need and he provides for you. All he's asking you is to be his child. Serve him. Humble yourself to, before him. He'll provide everything that is necessary. And we're talking here about physical things. You know, sometimes we think we need something. And I don't know if you've ever been in this position, but sometimes you think you need something and you buy it. And then you never use it. It sits on the shelf or in the garage and it takes up space and you go out there every once in a while. And I, I've done this. You go out to the garage and you go, oh yeah, that's still sitting there. I've never used that. That was like five years old now. And, and you'd never used it, but it was something you wanted at the moment. But it wasn't something I needed, obviously. And, and we, we get caught up and we get confused with that. But Jesus supplies all that we need. And that's important to remember physically. But he supplied something even more that is more of a blessing than the physical needs. 
in Luke chapter 5 and in uh, verse 31. Jesus uh, calls Levi, the, the apostle, um, in verse 27, and the Pharisees grumble about it because he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus says something that really strikes home. He says, the well don't need a physician, but the sick need a physician. And what he's talking about is not physical health there. He's talking about spiritual health. He says, you know the sinner? They're the ones that need help. If you're in a right relationship with God, which they weren't, but they thought they were, the Pharisees, if you're in a right relationship with God, you have no need of healing. You've been healed. But he said, I came to seek and save the lost, right? The sinners. He came as a physician to heal sinners because that is our greatest need. Spiritual redemption. You know, when we sin, you may not believe when we sin, we're not right with God. And that's a fact. And that's why Jesus came. So that we could again live with God, to have a relationship with God. But we needed our sin atoned for. And so in Colossians chapter uh, 1, Paul says in verse 14, well, we'll go back a little bit further. He said, we'll go back to verse 12. He says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus has provided for our greatest need, our spiritual redemption, the forgiveness of sins so we can have a relationship with God. Peter puts it a different way in 2 Peter chapter uh, 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, he he says that God provided for us a, a way into eternity. In verse uh, 11, he says, For in this way th there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus has provided a way for you and I to be in God's eternal kingdom. And so when you're in Christ here and you're receiving the blessings of the physical needs, you're in this eternal kingdom, just on earth. You haven't transferred your citizenship yet, but you're in his eternal kingdom because he's also provided that for you, which you could not get on your own. That is a blessing, folks, a blessing the world doesn't know, doesn't understand, and often doesn't want. But you and I, as Christians, have that blessing. How blessed can we be? Do you count your blessings? Do you name them one by one? If you do, I'd like to know how many you've had because I can't count them all. It's too hard to count all the blessings that we have in Christ. But I'm touching on several that cover most of the blessings that we have. We are not left needing anything. We might think that we're left wanting sometimes, but we're not left needing. Our Lord is faithful, and he's blessed us with everything that we need, now and for eternity. He's also blessed us with something else in his life that the world doesn't have. He's blessed us with confidence. You know, someone told me one time, they said, confidence is the key to success. That people can really do the job well, and if they have no confidence, they still fail. 
and people that don't do the job as well but have confidence in what they're doing grow and succeed. Confidence is something that is key to to success. And I got news for you. God wants you to succeed as his child in Christ. And so he's given us confidence. In 1 John chapter 5 and beginning in uh, verse 14 he says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him we can have confidence in going to God knowing that he wants what's best for us and that he wants us to be successful and if we ask anything in his name according to his will John says we have it it might not be in our time frame it might not be exactly the way we thought it should come out but we have it he promises us that and we can ask him with confidence in Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 to 16 he says we have such a high priest that's gone through everything we have so he understands and knows us and he says we can enter into his holy place with confidence and this is where people miss with confidence for his mercy and his grace in times of trouble do you know what happens a lot of times when we get in trouble we actually turn away from God because we're shamed and the Hebrew writer says that's the wrong thing to do what you need to do is repent turn to God go to him with confidence because he has mercy and grace for you in your times of trouble think about that for a minute where can the world turn when they get in trouble where can they go they have no advocate they have no grace or mercy from the Lord they got a hope that there's some individual out there that may have some grace and mercy but you and I have Jesus who is full of grace and mercy and if we're faithful to him we can go in confidence before him and we can ask and we'll be forgiven and we'll be strengthened and we can move on in our walk. So we have confidence in this life. Listen to what he says in Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and starting in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He says we can draw, we can enter the holy place. We can go before the throne any time, all the time with confidence because our God is faithful. He's merciful. That's a blessing that no one else in the world has that I know of. And I don't believe you can find that grace and mercy outside of Christ. And so in this life, we can live with confidence. But there's something else we can face with confidence. In 1 Thessalonians, and in chapter uh, 4 and in verse 13 Paul says but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope 
When he says asleep there, they've passed from this life. And he says, death is no big deal. We can have confidence to face death. How many people do you know can face death with confidence? I know I've been with people. There are some that face it with confidence. And there are more that face it very unassured. Even though they've claimed to live and be a Christian all their life, they are, unassured, they are not assured of their victory and their reward. And that's a sad statement. The scripture says we have the blessing of facing death with confidence because we know in death we have victory in Jesus. As he came out of that grave, we will come out of that grave and we'll be victorious with him. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Death, where's your sting? There's no more sting. The sting of death is the, the law and all of that. But he said, we don't have to worry about that. Death has no sting for us anymore. Death is a victory and we face it with confidence. There's a little girl, I think she had the right idea, the right spirit when she said, I go to church every Sunday so that when... And notice she says, so that when they carry me in one day, the Lord won't ask, who is this? The Lord knows his people. And I think she had the right idea. I mean, she may not have had this whole concept of the church, but she had the right idea. She knew that she would die one day and that she wanted to be with the Lord and recognized by the Lord. And she understood that. And you and I as Christians know that one day we will die. But we can have confidence in our death because it's not the end. It's just the beginning of all eternity with our Lord and Savior. And we can also have confidence in the judgment. In 1 John and in the fourth chapter, John says, starting in verse 16, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because he, as he is, so also are we in the world. Have you ever thought about that? Do you have confidence when you face your Father in heaven on the judgment seat? Do you have confidence in that judgment? If you have confidence in that judgment because of who you are, well, that may not work so well. But when we have Jesus as our advocate, his blood purifies us. And when God looks at us through his blood, he sees a pure and right disciple of his. That's the confidence that we can have. Because Jesus is our advocate. Not because we're so good. Because we're not. But because we're striving to be who he wants us to be. And the blood of Christ helps us to be that person. And we can have confidence because Jesus is on our side. If you're in the world and Jesus isn't your advocate, what hope do you have? That's why the world grieves as they do, because there's no hope. And so we ought to count our many blessings as Christians. I've just touched the highlights here a little bit this morning. There's too many to count, but we are so blessed beyond our greatest hope, our most vivid imagination of what blessing is because God is so wonderful and so merciful to us. We ought to raise our voices high in anthem in praise of God for all the blessings that he gives us. When Queen Victoria reigned in England, she would occasionally visit some of the humble cottages of her people and so one time she entered the home of this elderly widow 
And she stayed there for a time and had a tea and then enjoyed some fellowship. Later on, after she had gone, the poor woman was taunted by her worldly neighbors. Granny, they asked, who is the most honored guest that you've ever entertained in your home? They expected her to say Jesus, for despite their constant ridicule of, of her Christian witness, they recognized her deep faith. To their surprise and to their shame, she said, well, that would be Her Majesty the Queen, of course. And they thought, ha ha, we got you. We got you now. You're not going to get away with this time. And they said, how about that Jesus that you're always talking about? I thought he was your most honored guest. And she said, oh no, no, she said, that's not true, she said. And she silenced them all. She said, Jesus isn't a guest. He lives here every day. He's not a guest. The queen was just a guest. And it shut them up. Jesus is always with us. We have that blessing. He's looking after us. He's strengthening us. He's there for us to lean on, to ask our needs of. And he provides those needs. He is there for everything for us. He is our all in all. So if you haven't put on Christ as Lord, of your life. I think it's time that you do that. You won't regret it. It's what you need. It's what all of us need. And so if you need to do that, if you want our help, we invite you to come forward and receive that blessing while we stand and sing. I need Thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like Thine can peace afford. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, stay Thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when Thou art nigh. I need Thee, oh, need thee every hour I need thee oh bless me now my Savior I come to thee I need thee every hour in joy or pain come quickly and abide or life is vain. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Most Holy One, O oh, make me Thine indeed, Thou blessed Son. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee, every hour I need Thee, O oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. You may be seated.